Like some of these, I don't know where they would have broken off from. What the f There's another one. This is like the bottom of a tree. Like, where would this have broken off from? These are all standing trees with the top still on them. A big pile of them right here, just a pile. What? This. this could be like a nest or something. Like it's kind of flattened out right behind this thing. Like a nest or an observation point or something where they could hide behind. All of these just broken. This is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like this. Well, let's look at look at look what's happened in the past. Like uh, it's just it's really strange when it comes to the bigfooting world. Everybody would love to be something more than they are. Okay, now if you're if you know these Sasquatch are out there, uh, and you know they're out there, you're basically on the precipice of fame that nobody could even imagine. Which is true. It is. And it can be intoxicating for some people. All I gotta do is prove this and I'll be in the history books. You may as well be Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Could be bigger. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the thing is, uh, there's a lot of people that want that so bad that they become obsessed. There's another guy, he's a biologist that used to work here, and he, after he had a few drinks, he used to clean all the bones for the government and, and that are stored at the U of A. And he talked, he said basically they have Sasquatch. And he- They have Sasquatch bones? They have Sasquatch. They, he says, I'm not allowed to talk about them. There's things living in our forest. And, and I, I talked to some other guys and they said, no, he, he mentioned Sasquatch. He said the word. And he was out hunting by himself and he turned up dead. This latest expedition into the valley is essentially a trial run for a larger expedition that I'm planning on doing into this area just to kind of see what's feasible living out of a backpack. To be honest, I was pretty nervous going into this. I was alone. I was going to be extremely far from my vehicle, far from anybody. The hike to the location I wanted to be in 
was about 25 kilometers. So I was really putting myself in a vulnerable position. But over the years, after doing so many of these solo trips, I've kind of gotten used to the solitude, and I feel way more comfortable being in these remote wilderness areas, despite having Sasquatch on my mind, a creature that's thought by many to be something that's terrifying. Just here taking my first break on this trail. The trail starts off, it's like a, an ATV trail essentially. And uh, it's like that for quite a ways. And then it goes down into the river, like the dried up riverbed. And there's gonna be like a dozen, dozen more river crossings. This trail starts off like right at the start, you have to cross the stream and get your boots wet. And then there's a huge hill and it's just muddy. And there's lots of mosquitoes and it's really muggy out and humid so it makes hiking with all this shit very very difficult i have a lot of gear plus i'm carrying a dry bag full of food and i don't even think i have enough food to last me very long out here and now that i'm doing this it's a lot of it's a lot of work muddy spot here on the trail and uh, you can see there's quite a few wolf tracks on it so there are some dangerous animals around there's wolves there's a shit ton of bears in this area and with any luck Sasquatch I think one of the things that keeps your mind at bay when it comes to fear on these trips is that a lot of the time you're only thinking about how difficult it is hiking into these areas and carrying all this gear your mind is focused on the mission and getting to the location and how much it hurts physically to do these trips so you're kind of preoccupied with that <sighs> made it out of the trees the worst part of the trail is over. I hate that part. <sighs> Finally, at the creek in a more open area, feel a lot more comfortable here. <sighs> sort of get out of the bugs a little bit, I guess. <sighs> and onward to Ruby Mountain. I don't know how far I'm gonna make it. It's 3.30 right now in the afternoon and it's gonna get dark out at like 8.30. So I might not make it all the way to, to the falls probably won't unless I want to hike in the dark which you know I might but we will see no strange activity as of yet the Sasquatch reports that come out of this area describes encounters where the creatures are observing people as they move up the creek. The Sasquatch observe from the high banks and the ridges and they watch as the people move through to Ruby Falls. You can see one of these high banks in the background here and you can guarantee the whole time I was hiking I was watching these banks 
and keeping my eyes open for any movement and to see if anything was watching me and following me. And if they were, they were really good at it because I didn't see anything. It really makes hiking a lot easier when you have a water source the whole way. Walking up a creek, you have constant access to water. So you don't really have to carry it in your pack. If you're thirsty and you want to stop for a drink, you can just fill up your water bottle at pretty much any point and purify it using whatever means you have, whether it be chemicals or a filter system or even boiling it. Prior to this expedition, myself and a couple other members of the Alberta Sasquatch organization made a visit to one of my favorite people in the Bigfoot community, the world champion taxidermist and Bigfoot expert, Ken Walker. Ken is probably the most knowledgeable person that I know personally in the Bigfoot field. He's like a library of anecdotes. And he knows of all the encounters, all the historical encounters, all the encounters in Alberta, and all the encounters that are floating around the hunting and trapping community because he's directly involved in those scenes. Ken hears stories from regular people, regular hunters, who don't know very much about the Sasquatch topic. And, you know, he's somebody that they can go to and share their stories with. He's a person that won't judge anybody and will listen to everything you have to say, despite how crazy it might sound. There are just a lot of weird things going on. And he said, all of a sudden, one stand out on the road. And he said, look, kind of. And he says, it wasn't a big one. He said, walk across the road. And he said, well, that's something I'm not going to tell anybody I saw. He said, at one point, uh, there was a big female uh, with a small young one, and the young one was so small it walked on all fours. And uh, it walked out, and then another big female came out. And she had a, a juvenile with her that was limping, like it had been injured. And it was more like a, an adolescent, maybe not quite a teenager sort of thing. And it was walking on its hind legs. So it was two mature females with two children of different ages. No male, just that. But what it is is, Whenever you find those great big tree structures, like, you know, you find one of the small ones, it sounds like that area is where they all gathered just before they went up into the mountains for the winter. Like a bunch of them would show up there. And that's why those tree structures are so big there. And that's why the area hasn't dried up. They're, it's just that they're painfully aware that people are actually looking for them there. Hmm. I says, I know a guy who's been in the woods for 50 years, he'll say, He's seen two in his lifetime. Hmm. And then I'll talk to another guy who's been in the woods for 50 years. He's seen two. Now I know about four of them, but it took 100 years of you guys being in the woods. The only thing we have over top of them is our ability to compile knowledge. Hmm. That's the only way we will. Like the BFRO database. It's brilliant. Hmm. All the information is what you need. I wish they wouldn't hold a bunch of it back, but they do. But, but the thing is, uh, that's what we do because they run faster. Hmm. They think faster. They're way stronger. They're they're prescient. They have one on one. Their advantage over us is so astronomical that it's it's almost comical. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna walk around in the woods, you know, uh, and think you're fooling those things, the only person you're fooling is yourself. Mm -hmm. I make certain sounds. I go certain places, and I make sure that uh, that I'm easy to keep track of when I'm out there. We're daytime creatures. Yeah, and the Sasquatch is a nighttime creature has unbelievable night vision. Unbelievable. One of my friends was hunting in Alaska and he asked about the had any stories, the same trapper. She says, you mean Bigfoot? And he goes up in the mountains in the winter. He should be coming out any time. <laughs> and, uh, well, and that's how it is. Like they all gather where those big tree structures are. They say, okay, Frank's here. I don't know where Bob is. Maybe something happened to him. They basically get the gauge of who's left. And then when the snows hit, they go. 
And then the big ones come out and they gather food and bring it back to the females and the smaller ones. Because the tracker says you will not see a small track or a medium track until March. So they're in a cave or something. Well, and this is, then we found out there's a big cave up in there and it's full of animal skeletons like full. Right. And uh, so, yeah, and it's, and like when I say a cave, they described it as not as big as the Cadman Caves, they're not a lot smaller, so that's a major cave. There's a lot of, there's, they, I forget how many undiscovered caves they think there is, a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, these guys all want to be the latest person to find the cave, but you got to be really careful because as soon as you discover a cave, like that one they call the Sarlacc Pit, did you hear about that one in BC? Well, when they, they came out and told everybody about it, the, the local native band claimed it and knows what I'm doing. Now, I would love to go there because it's a natural uh, sinkhole. And if you're ever going to find a Sasquatch skeleton, that's where you're going to find it. I don't know what that one. Maybe even saber tooths. You know, there's a lot of prehistoric animals in those things. So, I mean, you know, but right now you have to, they're not letting anybody explore it, they're not letting anybody do it. So you have to be real careful. If you find something like that, you have to kind of keep it quiet. Finding this cave that Ken speaks about is one of the main objectives of my research in this area. Locating that cave could yield some substantial evidence, especially if it is indeed full of bones. If it's full of animal bones, maybe even Sasquatch bones, there could be physical or trace evidence left behind in or around that cave. The trouble is that this area is so vast and it makes it extremely difficult for one person to locate a small cave entrance. And without having an exact location, it'd be like trying to find a needle in a haystack. After taking multiple breaks on this hike, I eventually made it to my first camp. And I had camped in this area before with Keenan from the Alberta Sasquatch Organization. We didn't have anything strange happen. But this was where I was going to spend my first night because the hike was so long and I would continue it the next day. So I finally made it to my camp for tonight. This is the same spot that me and Keenan hiked to and camped at like a year ago. And there's nobody, nobody here. I've been the only one on the trail. Haven't heard anything, haven't seen any wildlife other than like grouse. And I am exhausted. I am exhausted. This hike is taxing, like very taxing. Losing daylight fast, it's getting pretty dark out now. And what you're seeing on camera is a pretty accurate representation of the darkness right now. With the ISO setting I have, it matches pretty much perfectly with how it actually looks in real life.
my body is just beat. What a long day. Doesn't look that bad on Google Earth when you look at the hike on, on Google, but in real life it's a completely different story. Before I got in the tent, I was using my night vision to kind of scan like across the river up on the ridge because apparently that's where these creatures have been seen is up on these ridges like observing people as they come through the through the valley up the creek so I, I did a scan but I couldn't see anything anything strange all is quiet tonight other than the wind and the sound of the river but hopefully nothing <laughs> nothing creepy approaches the tent I did opt for the 12 gauge with the pistol grip. It just makes it really easy to maneuver inside the tent if I have to use it. Hopefully I don't have to use it, but at least I have something. So. The mornings on this trip were quite cold and quite windy and it made me just want to you know get my stuff packed up and get moving as fast as possible because I knew once I started moving I would be warm I would get warm I'd get my blood flowing and things would be fine and I wouldn't have to worry about cold feet and cold hands but I had another two-hour push to my campsite at Ruby Falls and after being completely exhausted from the previous day's hike I was moving quite slow. You know, they, they tested that and they didn't know what it was and I, they weren't supposed to tell me. You tested what? The scat that I, the frozen they, scat, okay. it was inconclusive and they wanted to know where I found it in the circumstances. I said, are you willing to put into writing that it could be what I said it is? He said, no. And I said, well, what are we talking about then? Yeah, you know, I know what it is. Yeah. You don't want to believe me or you don't want to admit that you know too. Uh, I, off, I really regret taking that sample into them. Because you go into these stupid labs and they'll say, we even tested hair that was purported to be Sasquatch, but it turned out to be a buffalo. And I, I want to go in there and say, what about my sample? Why don't you use my sample as an example? Mm -hmm. Let me tell all the people here. I brought in Sasquatch DNA. I know it's Sasquatch DNA. And these people didn't know what it was. But 
um, there's another guy who's a biologist that used to work here, and he after he had a few drinks, he used to clean all the bones for the government that are stored at the U of A. And he talked, he said basically they have Sasquatch. And he... They have Sasquatch bones? They have Sasquatch. They, he says, I'm not allowed to talk about them. There's things living in our forest. And, and uh, I, I talked to some other guys and they said, no, he, he mentioned Sasquatch. He said the word. And he was out hunting by himself and he turned up dead. But, um, mm. but I mean, I knew, you know, and it was two very prominent policemen that introduced me to this guy. And then, of course, I know game ranchers that used to hear these stories. So I, I you know, he's gone now. I can't talk to him, but I really wish I could have because mm -hmm. he seemed to want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I tell people when I tell them things, I says, I don't want, I'm not telling you to believe me. I'm telling you to listen to me. Okay. Now, if you really are curious about this, research it yourself. Mm -hmm. Hear what I have to say, but don't take it as gospel. Just keep looking. And it gets to the point where, yeah, after you hear the same story a hundred, two hundred times, you have to start thinking, wait a minute. Because I have people tell me, well, 90% of those stories can't be true. And I said, did you just come up with that number? I said, I'll tell you what, the people I talk to, from what I can gather in knowing people in my 58 years of existence, is that 99% of them are true. I said, if, if the odd one gets through that isn't true, I don't know about it. I said, because... Nobody has anything to gain by telling these stories, and if they, and if they were the kind of people, you'd already know they were a liar before they told you. Yeah. But the thing is, most, well, almost all of the people, they have everything to lose by telling you this stuff. You know. Mm -hmm. I knew he had a story because of the way he was acting, so I just kept on. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that to finally he was on the Wapiti River, just by Grand Prairie there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he was walking down the river, say 15 years old or something. He said he he said he had a weird feeling, so he looked across the flat and he said there was a he said a big reddish brown colored bear. He called it a bear. Mm. And uh, he says as soon as I looked at it, he says it screamed and it charged me. Screamed. Well, no bear screamed. Mm. And uh, he said that he fired three shots before it turned. And um, then he started to go white. Then he started to shake, and then he lost his composure. And I had to sit with him for a bit. And he kept, you know, like it was like PTSD. It was, it, right? it was yeah. And uh, he kept saying, "I'll never go back. I'll never go back." I said, "At any time that this bear was coming towards you or running away, was it ever on all fours?" And he just shook his head. But anyway, obviously, they told him it was a bear, and that's how he recounted the story. Mm -hmm. But. Um, don't ever make fun of somebody. Listen to them. Listen to what they have to say, and uh, yeah. and just put it in the archives. All of a sudden, something will pop up where you realize that person is tell is telling the truth. Now, I'll give you an example. Now, remember that one woman that everybody she says she has that habituation. She's down in the states. I forget her name. And she says they used to unscrew the lid on her horse feed, eat eat it, and then they'd screw the lid back on. And uh, everybody says she's crazy. She's lying and stuff like that. Anyway, she said, well, no, I can always tell when they did that because they'd leave three rocks on top of the horse feet. That stopped me in my tracks because that's what the trapper told me. Every time they robbed his track, they left three rocks on the top. And as soon as I read that, I realized this woman's telling the damn truth. I knew right away. Uh, because this trapper would, would even begin to read anything somebody else had written online. I don't think he has a computer. And... How do, you, how do you both tell the same story? It's too perfect, mm -hmm. you know, and it's gifting. It's gifting mm -hmm. and it's, it's a gesture. So right away, I was inclined to believe that person. It's kind of like the, the pictures of the face in the window. Everybody's, you know, there's a debunking article right away. Well, I sent the picture to a guy who's actually seen one, toe to toe, out hunting. And he fires right back and says, yeah, that's one. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that image is burned into his face. And I mean, it's it's pretty specific when you look at that thing, you know, with the big flat nose. And also, too, I can tell you right now, like, if that's a model, he would have had to build a new one for every picture because the face is moving, the eye positions are different. And when it when you did see its eyes, they were those big, hollow black eyes that they describe, you know, in every description you read.
when you approach Ruby Falls, you really get a sense of how beautiful and amazing this place is and how unique it is. It's one of the most beautiful places in Alberta that I've hiked to. And when you come down that final stretch of trail through the trees and things open up, it's just an amazing feeling that you don't get too often. And it really boosts morale. If you're tired, if you're exhausted, and you feel like you don't really want to be there, when you see a view like that, it really brings you back up and gets you excited. It gets you excited to be there, and it gets you excited to explore. It gets you excited for the adventure. Even if you feel scared or if you feel lonely, it still manages to make you want to push forward and keep going. I completed the hike without having any strange activity. I didn't see anything weird. I didn't hear anything weird. And things seemed to be quite normal. There was nothing out of the ordinary that happened. And being alone, most of the time you're fine with that. Even if you want to find Sasquatch or evidence of Sasquatch. When you're doing a solo expedition, a lot of the times you're content with nothing happening, with nothing scary or creepy happening. Though how exciting would it be to come across a set of tracks or to catch a glimpse of one of these creatures in the distance? It would be a really special moment. The camp area at Ruby Falls is really nice because they had actually constructed really nice picnic tables there and fire pits. So it makes, you know, living out in the wilderness a little bit easier. It is really nice to have luxuries like that. A place where you can sit, a place where you can make your food and just hang out. And you don't have to worry, you know, about sitting in the dirt, sitting in the wet grass. It's a comfort that you wouldn't usually have in a backcountry hiking trip. Even though you want to get out into the deep wilderness, as far away from civilization as possible, it still is nice to have these little luxuries, and I for sure was not opposed to it. So I just did my nightly scan of the area around me with my night vision and I uh, haven't seen anything peculiar. No movement, no wildlife, no Bigfoot, nothing strange. So it's been a really cold day, really cold evening. Very, very windy today. Like, I couldn't tell at any point which way the wind was blowing because it was just changing constantly. It was like I was in some sort of weird vortex. And a little bit of rain, just about snow, but mostly rain, and it looks like things are starting to 
we are up right now for the night, which is really nice. Hopefully I wake up with blue skies. We can get some solid exploring in. Aside from the wind, it's been another quiet night. No activity, no weird noises, nothing making its way into camp. I haven't seen any wildlife other than grouse and squirrels, which I find kind of odd. I thought for sure I would see something like a bear. But nothing as of yet. There are a lot of vantage points around me where these creatures can, you know, observe me if they wanted to come in and do that. And I'm constantly watching the ridges and looking out for anything looking back at me. Hopefully these clouds clear and it gets sunny out. But today I'm just going to be exploring the valley, seeing I can find anything strange or noteworthy or anything worth documenting. Hopefully, with any luck, we'll catch a glimpse of the Sasquatch. It's really nice to be able to get out and explore these areas and to see how much beauty is out there. We get caught up in city life sometimes and we kind of forget you know, what the real world is like, what nature is like, and this area really showcases nature's beauty. And I started off my exploration of this valley you know, being pretty excited and curious and not really knowing what I was going to come across. And as far as the exploring goes, things were going good till I came across a really strange sight that for a while I could not explain and it made me nervous to be honest. And I thought this could be it. I could be closer than ever of discovering these Sasquatch creatures for myself, of actually seeing one. I had to try pretty hard to not let my nerves get the best of me. 
I was scared, nervous, and excited all at the same time. And my brain was jumping to all sorts of crazy conclusions. That one definitely didn't fall there. That was pulled out somewhere and either thrown or put there somehow. There's the root system and the ground is more or less undisturbed. This is very weird. What the f there's another one. This is like the bottom of a tree. Like, where would this have broken off from? These are all standing trees with the top still on them. We could be heading into the den. Where did that come from? Where did this break off from? This is broken and not chopped. But where did it fall from? These trees are all intact. A big pile of them right here, just a pile. What is this? This could be like a nest or something. Like it's kind of flattened out right behind this thing, like a nest or an observation point or something where they could hide behind. All of these just broken. This is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like this. that. Where did that come from? Where did this big ass tree come from? Broken off. There's no stumps here. Like
Like some of these, I don't know where they would have broken off from. I initially thought, look at this. These are the tops. These are the tops of these trees. It's like they're, they're connected at the end at the bottom. How did that happen? on the other side of the car. I think you were telling, I was asking about it before. You said there's more structures somewhere oh, in yeah. the back there? Yeah, yeah. Like, and a uh, hamper too, like um, where there's like a tree, it's like it's a bird tree, it's like a tuning fork. And there's a, it's in Big Fur, it's a really qu quick photograph of it. But they, it, what it did is it took the, held the tree like this and it pulled another tree down in the center so it's caught like this. And I mean, you look at it and say, well, I could have just fallen there until you realize there's nothing above it. There's no way it could have fallen. The only way it could have got there is to go up. So, but then when you realize that something with its right hand, because when you make a mark on a burnt tree, it doesn't go away. And you can see the mark where it held. Uh -huh. So, you know, and then there's a lot of really small structures. There's two places in there where you can actually follow the structures on a trail. Mm -hmm. And the first time Aaron and I walked down there, we got three structures in and I said, well, I'm not prepared to do this. I said, I haven't got my gun, for one thing. I said, and I haven't got, we haven't got proper cameras. You know, we're following this trail and it's obvious, each time you find a structure, if you looked at where the trail is, just almost out of sight, you'd see another structure. So there was one big structure on the front of the road. I got a picture of me. When I went back there, we, because we followed the three in, they must have been watching us because they tore down the first structure. And the other thing too is, is somebody told me that if you, if you find a high tree break, and you, you follow the direction where the tree is, is pointing, you'll find another one. And they, they basically use those to stay off of the trail. You know, they, they follow them. Mm. Uh, and that makes sense to me because I have followed them for a little bit and found other ones that way. Mm. But I've never, I've never put a whole bunch of time. When I go up where the Sasquatches are, I don't like to be too intrusive. Yeah. This this was a guy found this way in the in a in a in Waterton. Bindernagel went crazy when we get when we sent him this photograph. Uh, right on a, on a heavy used elk trail, it was a blind setup, and the guy said it was so eerie standing there looking at it that he finally had to leave. And somebody said, "Well, people made it." And he goes, "No, we we went through the middle of a, a nasty valley of Waterton." He said, "Where nobody would go," mm -hmm. and he says, "We found this thing." That was the first one we found, my tracker and I found it. I saw it from the back of his skidoo in the winter and I said, we gotta go back. I know what this is. Because, uh, see, I found these structures in there. If anybody made them, like if somebody said, well, somebody made them, the only person who would have made them would have been me. And I didn't make them, I found them. But the thing is, I've, I've seen pictures of them on the internet yeah. and I knew about the Sasquatch sightings in the area, but even the trapper wasn't aware that these were made by them. So this was something that I found in relation to the sightings. Okay. So, you know, so if anybody made them, I did. But like, even the trapper said when we looked at him, he said, you need heavy equipment to make some of these. So I'm really like wondering what the heck is going on here with these fallen trees because it seems to be a narrow strip of trees going from one side of the creek all the way across to the other side, just all knocked over and thrown around and tossed in random places and like the bottoms of the trees up in the air with like nowhere for them to have come from. So like I'm pretty nervous right now because I'm alone, there's nobody else in this valley. I haven't heard any ATVs, nothing. Um, so right now at this point, like going up this valley, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty nervous. I did pull out my shotgun just because it makes me feel a little bit better. And if anything wants to grab me and uh, make a sequel to the Albert Osman story, it might ward them off from doing that, hopefully. 
because who knows like I was told they come to this area in the winter and it's like late September now so maybe they've moved through here maybe they broke down all these trees in like it's it's like a line so maybe they did that to you know I guess scare people away it's like a warning sign to stay out of this area and if that's the case I have crossed that boundary I keep looking at these like ridges to see if anything's up there watching me I haven't seen anything yet it really gives me the creeps though I'm gonna make my way up to where the fallen trees are up on the top of this area here this is on the other side of the river as to where I was before Maybe they're structures or something like that. Who knows? Who knows? You can see these white tips where it broke off. You can see them behind there. There's some more. This is really weird. Look at this. Just broken off. Okay, so after making my way up to the top here and after doing some critical thinking, what this is starting to look like to me is an avalanche path. Pretty sure that's what it is. I mean, the brakes and stuff, they look pretty fresh, but this could have just happened this last winter. And you can see all the trees like pushed over That's what it's starting to look like. You have a slope right behind me here. It looks a bit like, it looks to me to be the perfect angle, you know, to have an avalanche. So usually that 37, between 37 and 39 degrees, that's the perfect angle for an avalanche. So. is starting to look like that and that would explain why there's branches and trees in places where there, there shouldn't be branches and trees so i think i can let my guard down a bit more now and chill out a bit and push on into the valley i was pretty nervous there for a bit i'm like what the hell could have done this it must have been sasquatch it had to have been like a group of sasquatch but now I'm thinking it's probably most definitely an avalanche. So that's my conclusion anyways. Though with most of this stuff, despite how weird it may seem, there's usually a more logical explanation. Looking at all the pushed over trees, you can tell that it was for sure an avalanche that did that. Pushed over the trees with such extreme force that it ripped some of them out of the ground by the roots and sent them up into the air, upside down, stuck in between other trees. It's just crazy how much force an avalanche can have, how much power to be able to do that. It was nice to be able to calm down and relax after coming to that conclusion. However, it was also kind of disappointing. It was exciting imagining that I was in a place where Sasquatch had come through and ripped the trees out of the ground and 
threw them all over the place and made little structures or nests. How fantastic would that be? But of course, that would have been too good to be true. This valley is so vast and desolate. I didn't see any forms of life while I was walking through that area. I had my shotgun at the ready just in case I bumped into a bear. That was my main concern was the bears running into a grizzly bear and knowing that I might have to fight it off somehow. But I didn't encounter anything like that. The valley was essentially lifeless other than myself and some birds and the plant life. I didn't see anything and I expect to see Sasquatch in this area. This is where all the anecdotes and all the evidence point is to this area. This is where I'm told they're supposed to be. So if the Sasquatch aren't around this area then where are they? Are they somewhere else close by? Who knows? They could literally be anywhere. They could be constantly moving. With the valley being so open and vast, it would make sighting something the size of a Sasquatch very easy. You'd be able to see it from a mile away, and it would make recording it on video much less difficult than if it was in the deep bush. Hills, a friend of mine uh, outfits antelope down there and they ended up the fog rolled in and so you know you can't hunt antelope in the fog they, the hunter wanted he was a doctor he wanted to go for a drive and uh, so they went for a drive in the fog and they ran into a big gray sasquatch in the fog they saw it twice and 
<clears throat> they, they made fun of that guy, you know, he, he was mad. He says, well, we saw it, we saw it. And this was at Cypress Hills. And he said, uh, uh, he says, I, but I asked that doctor. And I says, what did you guys really see? And he said, he said he was a real laid back, calm kind of guy. And he says, well, about what he said, it's about what we saw. <laughs> so yeah, so that guy, he's, I think he works as a gunsmith down in Calgary. Whenever you're doing a set up, always take a dog with you. And the reason being is because they don't like dogs, because uh, the dogs, they uh, sense the electromagnetic, they communicate with electromagnetic energy, and I, I firmly believe the Sasquatch does too. And so the dog will pin them every time. The dog will freak out. And to the point where, that's how I proved to Dan, who made the Big Fur movie, because I do that Wulu call, and I called, I called uh, at the thing there, Ten minutes later, there was a Sasquatch on that ridge because the dog was nuts. And I told him it's downwind. I said, "I'm in downwind because it's dank, you know." And uh, and I gave that one, and I didn't call too much. I just gave a couple of really quick calls so they don't really. Oh, yeah. What does it sound like? Call. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That one. Hmm? Yeah, you've heard it on the Sierra sounds. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's got that break in it. That's the one that I do. And I do it loud, but twice, real fast, because it'll catch them. Now they're waiting. Now if you do it again, it's the same as calling moose. They'll say, oh, that's not real, because then, now they're listening. You want to make sure that they hear it, but before they can listen, it's, well, I better check it out, because if it's not calling again, it could be Frank, he might be in trouble. The guy was sitting on a hill, two Sasquatch walked below, and he photographed him. These are good. These are good photos, actually. If you uh, you see how that it's got the bend of the shoulder. See the leg trailing far behind, and look how wide in the shoulders. I mean, those are, those are Sasquatch. That looks exactly like Patty. Mm -hmm. um, and there's here's uh, well two other two other pictures. Uh, the same two. Hmm. And it was just a hunter. He he and that guy wouldn't talk to me. I sent him a message. Wouldn't talk to me. He was a Sasquatch thread. He put up two pictures, never put in anything, no words, no nothing. That's an elbow. And this is a thigh. Oh, wow. And this is also the daytime. You never got the picture at nighttime because they could see the infrared trigger. But in the daytime, they can't. But he walked by the camera. And the camera woke up and got a picture of him just when he was almost past. The guy said, I don't know what this is, but it's walking up right. Oh, it's a bear. And he says, no, there's no bears in there. The farmer told me, so obviously it was along the riverway. This guy's, this guy's name was Booney. He's a premier whitetail hunter. So he has cameras year round and things like that. So, you know, that, that one I think is, you know, is pretty good. This is that one that that guy took at Edson, remember? Anyway, you got rocks thrown at him, eh? But you see, they always, the younger ones have a narrow heel. Oh yeah, and then they get like uh, a lot of them, like the the juveniles, they have the massive toes play too, right? Yeah, this one here, like the the guy said, he got screamed and chased back to the car, and he never did make casts. You know, there's moose tracks here. He said they were about you know 13 inch long tracks. Mm -hmm. were. He says, but you couldn't match the stride. You know, it's funny because uh, the one that I saw, uh, South Kidney Lake on the Blue Ridge Road. As far as I was concerned, I was looking at him because I didn't believe the guy with me asked me. Sasquatch. I said, that Sasquatch? I said, no, no, it has to be a man. No such thing as a Sasquatch. But this guy ran up a steep hill and I was slowing down, even a bear can do And uh, And it wasn't a big one. I What I think happened was a big one crossed and the young one held back and then the young one got scared and ran when I drove up. Because it wasn't, it was only six foot tall maybe. But it moved like, like you know the Memorial Day footage? Yeah. Where it runs across <laughs> the film, the, that side of the mountain? That's exactly what it's like. Now, why would you, why would your human, why would you run with that kind of, well, it was, why would you be that scared? It was, that's what I wanted to know. Why are you scared? Why are you dressed all in black during bear season? And, uh, but then Don Brockman came by here one day and he said, this, the loggers told me they're, they're seeing Sasquatch at night and pulling logs out of South Kidney Lake. So I grabbed the map and I said, that's exactly where I saw mine. And he said, yeah, they're seeing him at night. And they, he says, they weren't warned not to talk about the threat. And uh, so when those the people on the thing there were talking about uh, out by Blue Ridge there, 
Like if you go uh, if you go north of Kidney Lake, you'll hit the Freeman, and that's where Adrian Erickson told me sitting on that Freeman. And people see them on the highway. The Freeman River, or the Freeman River north of Kidney Lake, like by the Swan Hills. Mm -hmm. But if you go just north of that, you'll you hit the highway going from uh, Fort Assiniboine and Swan Hills. They always people always see them. There's so many deer that see the Sasquatches there at night all the time. Like that's a hot spot for seeing. The more of them get shot by hunters than you know. Well, Kip Kelly's dad, George Kelly, is famous. You know George Kelly? No. He's, uh, his brother shot when they were cone picking. He had the kids with him. Now, the old guy's dead, but the kids are still alive. Cousins. And he turned around and there was a big Sasquatch standing with the kids. So he shot it. And it screamed. Ran away, but he was terrified. You know, they always have an old beat up 303, you know. There's the Sasquatch, there's the, the patty. Before we go, can you show us the the crap? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I almost forgot. We're freezing on top of it. <laughs> there it is. This is it. The last two bags of it. Oh, well, that's cool. That's cool shit. See, the snow is still in there. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. What's that? Justin Bieber taste test. You need it. <laughs> he doesn't like that. No. Just, just a fine little. Uh -huh. I gave a bag of this to. You know what he did? He thought it out. Really? He thought it out. I, I should never have given it to him. He probably taste tested. No, I said you don't thought out. No, I need to thought out. I said. You don't thaw it out. I says because the bacteria compromise within 20 minutes, then it's nothing. Then it, then I may as well shit in the bag and give it to you. You know, like in all seriousness. You probably should have done that. So you, you know, you thaw it out, and, and like no, no, I right, 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 sign out. Like it's shit. You know, it, it needs an expert. Well, I guess well, he's at bullshit. That's what it's like. <laughs> I was at the ready all the time. I had my camcorder handy and I was waiting, but at no point during my exploration did I see anything that resembled a Sasquatch. Despite not witnessing anything strange or finding any strange evidence, I will be returning to this valley for an extended stay, a longer expedition, to see if I can attract anything to my location. That seems to be the way to go to not be constantly looking and searching, but to attract them to you or to make them feel comfortable enough with you that they come in close and make their presence known. Well, let's look at look at look what's happened in the past. Like uh, it's just it's really strange when it comes to the bigfooting world. Mm -hmm. Everybody would love to be something more than they are. Okay, now if you're if you know these Sasquatch are out there, uh, you know they're out there. You're basically on the precipice of fame that nobody could even imagine. Which is true. Yes. And it can be intoxicating for some people. All I gotta do is prove this and I'll be in the history books. You may as well be Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Could be bigger. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the thing is, uh, there's a lot of people that want that so bad that they become obsessed. 